Hello, today I'm going to be speaking about malignant hyperthermia and every facility throughout the country that's licensed must provide proof on staff education on treatment of malignant hyperthermia. So today I'd like to provide the in-service portion of training Somewhere further down in the year, the anesthesia staff will um, provide mock MH drills to ensure that we are compliant with education in this topic. Why do we have to educate staff about malignant hyperthermia? It is a dangerous situation that has a high mortality if it is not treated, identified and treated quickly. So today I wanna to talk about the condition and what the crisis presents itself with, and how you as the clinical team will respond in assisting the anesthesia department uh, for treating of malignant hyperthermia. Epidemiology of MH was do first documented in the 60s. Not all cases involve anesthesia drugs. Sometimes malignant hyperthermia presents from stress or trauma, but for our cause today, um, I want to stay strictly on uh, how the anesthesia medications can precipitate a case of malignant hyperthermia. Uh, you can see some numbers. Uh, children affected uh, a little bit more than adults and males a little bit more than females. But that's really just um, um, what we know today since the 60s on, on the prevalence of this condition. What's the rate of occurrence? It's kind of unknown. It is a very rare reaction. Sometimes as frequently as one in 5,000 or as rare as in one in 65,000 administrations of general anesthesia with triggering agents. And we'll talk about these triggering agents. Uh, we all need to know in your facility what drugs can trigger malignant hyperthermia reactions. Uh, the incidence can depend on the uh, concentration of MH uh, families in a geographical area. Certain parts of the country have higher risks uh, because of multiple generations uh, staying in those regions. The mortality, as I mentioned, can be very high if we're not quickly identifying an MH reaction in a patient. Uh, but when we quickly identify it, call it the crisis, respond and treat appropriately, we have a very good chance of um, uh, survival. What we're looking for is acidosis, hyperkalemia, um, and organ failure when this event is not treated uh, quickly. The pathophysiology tends to be pretty complicated and I would direct your questions uh, further with the anesthesiologist at your center because they are the experts and they are the most trained with uh, malignant hyperthermia. But I kind of like to just keep it simple and talk about um, what's happening in the skeletal muscle cell and that is a calcium release. When a patient is exposed to a certain triggering agent um, in the operating room, a um, reaction begins in the skeletal muscle cell. And this can become um, dangerous if left untreated. Un un uh, this leads to the hypermetabolism that we're seeing in these individuals. Increase um, sympathetic uh, sympathetic uh, activity, carbon dioxide production, oxygen consumption, and this leads to disruption of the muscle cell membrane. And um, that's a danger we face. Temperatures can go high, uh, although later in the reaction, uh, temperature elevation is a dangerous sign of malignant hyperthermia. I equate this reaction to something like a marathon runner, if you've ran a marathon. And at the end of the race, your body is uh, at um, a very high metabolism but it starts to reside, re, re, uh, come back to steady state. Uh, with a malignant hypothermia reaction, this, this metabolism does not turn off. This patient's body continues at that high hypermetabolism um, hyper rate. And if we're not treating it with the correct medications, uh, patients uh, do not survive. Well, it is a rare reaction. Um, you know, when I do these talks, probably one in 100 
clinical staff will raise their hand has have ever seen a malignant hyperthermia reaction. One of the reasons is a genetic condition. MH susceptibility is an inherited with an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. This means that children and siblings of a patient with MH uh, have a 50% chance of inheriting this condition. Hence, um, if both parents are positive, all children will uh, carry on this gene. Therefore, MH reactions um, skip generations, um, and uh, it is something that uh, we rely on patients' information when trying to diagnose or present individuals that are susceptible. Um, what else has to happen if a malignant hyperthermia reaction would occur? Number one, they have to have the gene, and number two, they have to be exposed to a triggering agent. And you need to know those agents that are stocked in your facility. Almost every anesthesia cart carries succinylcholine, which is a muscle relaxant used during procedures by anesthesia. That triggers malignant hyperthermia in these individuals. The other class of medications known for triggering MH are the halogenated volatile in, uh, anesthetics, the inhalation gases. So know what your facility carries. If a patient is under general anesthesia, know that that is a triggering agent and patients must be observed for malignant hyperthermia reactions. Anesthesia fortunately has many options for providing sedation during surgery that are not triggering for malignant hyperthermia. Local anesthetics include narcotics, ketamine, barbiturates, there's nitrous oxide, propofol, uh, uh, etomidate, uh, benzo benzodiazepines are fine. The muscle relaxants are also uh, available as non-triggering agents, and that could possibly be rocuronium or zimuron, uh, typically seen in uh, the operating rooms today across the country. So remember triggering agents, succinylcholine, inhalation anesthetics, exposed to positive gene patients may result in MH reactions. Let me also explain that these individuals with the gene, upon exposure to a triggering agent, does not always result in an MH reaction. Individuals may have multiple exposures to triggering agents, multiple surgeries, without an MH reaction beginning. The very next exposure, it may precipitate an MH event. I had a nurse ask me, John, I had a patient the other day that I interviewed prior to surgery. They said they had general anesthesia three years ago. It, does that allow me to say that they're negative for MH reactions? And I said, no. Patients do not always react with every exposure. They can still have the gene, uh, be gene positive. Remember also that the best way we can diagnose or uh, um, determine if a patient is at risk is by their history, their family history of surgery in the past, of a exposure to anesthesia drugs in the past. Every patient arriving at your facility would be interviewed by the nurse and the anesthesiologist, and the similar questions should be asked. Have you or your family members ever had problems with anesthesia or surgery in the past? That will allow us to determine the course of surgery at your facility or a cancellation of the surgery in the event that it can't be performed uh, using safe agents. So two important steps there in providing safe care for your patients. So in the preoperative assessment, as I said, both by nursing and anesthesia, we're asking about their family history, not with just MH, but with any problems with surgery or anesthesia at all. Caffeine intolerance is something that patients may um, uh, present, which would need a follow-up with anesthesia. Prior complications arising from anesthesia, unexplained fever, colocolor urine, history of muscle weakness, cramps, or muscle group Hyper, uh, hypertrophy. The pediatric assessment should also include some of the conditions listed on this slide. This sometimes has a, uh, a relationship 
to positive MH gene carriers. There is one diagnostic test that is conclusive for a gene positive patient. As you can see here, it's a muscle biopsy test, not available in a lot of facilities in this country and quite, quite expensive. Uh, and as I've heard, very painful to have this test done on a piece of muscle uh, on the individual. From speaking to anesthesiologists, many have told me that they instruct a patient who has a history of MH or family history to just inform their entire family to state that with uh, any surgical procedure, going into any surgical procedure, that there's a family history of MH. And allow, that allows the anesthesiologist to provide and plan for the safest uh, type of sedation, avoiding triggering agents. So again, we do not see the test that often. Uh, a second test is, has been uh, out for a while, and that is the DNA test. Uh, when it first uh, was available, it uh, had false negatives, which we can't afford to have that uh, show up. So it was not used for many years, and I believe that they're slowly going to bring that back with a better um, uh, testing rate. So if we have someone that is suspected to have the gene, okay, what can we do? Well, we want to plan surgery uh, that is the safest, and that means avoiding triggering agents. We want to monitor the patient. We want to look at uh, these parameters. And um, if the procedure cannot be performed, then the anesthesiologist will um, cancel the case. Some facilities have an administrative policy that says all cases are canceled if there is any history discovered of MH in their family. Um, others' policies allow the anesthesiologist to make that decision. So anesthesia plans for other forms of sedation may be regional when possible, non-triggering anesthetic agents. Uh, and the anesthesia machine is cleaned and uh, flushed. And uh, a lot of times, uh, an MH risk patient is, is the first case of the day. So what are we going to see when a patient presents with MH? A reaction can, and in, uh, can begin in the operating room, but it is not always uh, first presented in the OR. Sometimes there's a delayed reaction after exposure to the triggering agent, sometimes up to 60 minutes, possibly even longer. So many cases have been diagnosed when the surgery is complete and the patient's already in recovery room. So that means the entire healthcare team needs to be familiar with the signs, early signs of MH. There are posters. Uh, from the national organization M House in each operating room and in the recovery area, please pay attention to and review those early signs periodically throughout the year, and pay attention to what we're going to see early in the reaction: um, tachyarrhythmia, tachypnea, acidosis. Uh, I've underlined sudden increase in total CO2 because that's a very high predictor of an MH reaction in the operating room when the anesthesiologist begins to see this and they've ruled everything else out about the uh, increase in end-tidal CO2, they are immediately thinking uh, malignant hypothermia. The rigidity is very pronounced, early and most visible in an MH reaction. The, the uh, masseter jaw muscle, um, arms and uh, leg rigidity, almost stone-like, can present in an individual uh, early onset malignant hypothermia. And uh, the skin, I've underlined temperature increase, and that is something that we cannot wait to see because it is usually delayed and occurs later in this reaction. And many have said that if we are waiting to respond to an MH crisis for temperature rise, we may have missed the point of reversing an MH reaction. So please um, uh, know those early signs. 
uh, and call the emergency and call anesthesia quickly when you're first seeing the, um, these early signs. When an MH event is um, diagnosed by the anesthesiologist, a crisis call will be made. And many facilities use an overhead page, and that would be an announcement of MH to your location three times. Um, in the operating room, that would be announced so that we are requesting your assistance for the clinical team to assist with uh, treating uh, uh, MH. The surgeon in the, air, in the OR will be asked to stop or close the procedure as best as possible and as quickly as possible. At, that, at this point, your anesthesia provider is in charge of the care of the patient and also the team responding uh, to treating MH. They discontinue all triggering agents. They begin to hyperventilate with 100% O2. And as the team arrives, many steps have to be take, begun immediately. Your facility has assignment cards on your cart that can be distributed and actions taken quickly. And this will be further demonstrated when you have your MH drill with the anesthesiology team. So the circulator may have a role to page anesthesia for the MH cart. That has to immediately arrive to the area, call for additional support. Uh, the anesthesia will begin to possibly place a second IV line, draw blood as needed. And immediately as nurses arrive, the mixing of the reversal medication, dantrolene, should begin uh, um, uh, immediately. Again, I stress, if you're an RN and you arrive to MH crisis, do not wait to be assigned to mix the dantrolene. Go immediately to the cart, remove the medication and supplies to prepare this drug, and begin mixing. This is a medication that reverses the reaction and is most important in saving lives. Everything else is supportive, a cooling nurse uh, supportive to keep temperatures maintained, but again, mixing this drug is very critical. A technician may be asked to bring the MH cart, crash cart, cooled saline from the medication refrigerator, and bags or buckets of ice to begin possibly uh, cooling externally to this patient. Uh, a PACU nurse will bring a code cart, prepare meds as needed by anesthesia, sometimes bicarb, insulin, calcium chloride, uh, Lasix, antiarrhythmics, anti et, et cetera. Calcium channel blockers are contraindicated when administering the rescue drug dantrolene, uh, but other drugs may be ordered during this, um, this crisis. What's our cooling nurse going to be looking to do? Assemble an NG tube, Foley with urometer, rectal tube, uh, give NG tube to anesthesia, insert Foley rectal tube, prepare to possibly lavage the stomach, bladder, rectum, any open cavities if temperature starts to elevate. Again, upon direction of the anesthesiologist, these steps are ready to begin by, by an individual responding to the crisis. The nurses, as I said, have already begun mixing the medication. Uh, Dantrolene is a uh, 20 milligram vial, it's a powder. It must be mixed with sterile water, 60 mLs, and it does take some time. But every RN working at every institution must be comfortable mixing this medication because at any time you may be called upon to assist with treating MH. So if you have not practiced and, demo and demonstrated your skills to mix this medication, please talk to your supervisor. We have expired drug and, and, and uh, syringes in order to practice and, and learn that technique. I'd rather see this uh, worked out now in an off time setting than uh, in a crisis where I've seen um, um, staff uh, not know uh, to do this uh, efficiently as possible. Our dose to begin treating MH is at a 2.5 milligram per kilogram bolus that is given as an IV push. We have a dosing chart on the MH cart. You'll be looking up a patient weight and immediately determining how many vials need to be administered for this 2.5 milligram per kilogram loading dose. Very simple chart. Again, if you're not familiar with it, locate where your MH cart is, look at that chart, 
and determine if you can quickly identify your vials. A 200-pound patient, for instance, would require 12 vials for the loading dose. So you can see that we want you to begin mixing as quickly as possible. Uh, if a loading dose is administered and the patient's reaction is not subsiding, anesthesia will order a second loading dose and a possibly a third loading dose or a fourth loading dose. So vials of medications are going to be uh, being mixed as quickly and uh, as long as possible by the staff. But this is an important step. As I said, uh, if you're not comfortable, we can help with uh, practice sessions on mixing the drug. So what does dantrolene do? Well, it's a skeletal muscle relaxant. It works in the skeletal muscle cells where the uh, uh, MH is beginning. It inhibits that calcium release and the contraction. Uh, remember, must be mixed with sterile water. It's given as an IV push and it's immediately administered so we don't really have to worry about protecting it from light or stability uh, problems if we're administering it immediately. There are a few names of this medication. Dantrolene is the generic name, but brand names come out as Dantrium, Ravanto, and a most recent uh, FDA-approved drug, Rhinodex. Uh, right now, facilities around the country are using Dantrium or Ravanto in a 20 milligram size. Uh, you can see the manufacturers and distribution centers. Rhinodex, approved about two years ago by Eagle Pharmaceuticals in New Jersey, instead of a 20 milligram vial, this is a concentrated form of the medication in a 250 milligram vial. So bolusing a loading dose can be quite um, uh, quicker, usually in a couple minutes for a loading dose with this new product. Um, every facility licensed in the country must have a minimum of 36 vials of the Dantrium or Rovanto. You would have to carry three vials of Rhinodex to uh, make up the 36 vials of the other product. Uh, pricing is quite dramatic. Um, 36 vials of the Dantrium or Rovanto is about $2,500, and the stability is about two and a half years. Rhinodex, three vials is almost $7,500 with a two-year shelf life. So right now, the standard of care remains Dantrim and Rivanto until proven that uh, outcomes uh, are achieved better with, with the new product. MHouse, the Molina Hypothermia Association of the United States, is manned um, hotline 24 hours a day by an anesthesiologist. And one of the first calls we make in an MH crisis is to the hotline. 1-800-644-9737. That phone call is also on all the phones throughout the clinical areas of the facility. That sometimes is a very important call for your anesthesiologist. When that anesthesiologist asks the call to be made, make the call, patch it into the area, and the anesthesiologist can be assisted by the M-House uh, doctor on the phone to move this um, uh, crisis along um, and optimize survival for your patient. After our initial actions, cooling hopefully uh, of the body comes down. Uh, we hopefully will transfer them to the PACU or to a um, hospital with an ICU. Therefore, we may be calling numbers for 911. We may be calling the hospital to alert the anesthesia team at the hospital that they're going to be receiving an MH patient. And again, we're treating the acute phase of MH. MH is a reaction that has a second phase um, that can redevelop, and that's why the patient will be heading to an ICU for further evaluation and further treatment for 48 to 72 hours. After MH, uh, while most cases uh, of MH occur during anesthesia, the one-hour period following surgery is also a critical time, so that's why we're paying attention to every surgical procedure um, throughout their stay for early signs of MH. And if the PACU nurse does detect it, uh, they should assign the uh, dantrolene mixing and cooling nurse immediately. It is an emergency. It is requiring proper teamwork, preparation of medications and training to avoid uh, serious adverse consequences. And it's important for all of us to know and understand our roles. And that's the message today is to let you individually think about your preparation in being a team partner in treating MH. If you have any questions or if you want to uh, review the hospital policies 
or if you need to speak with the anesthesiologist, do this now and, and uh, that will further help you uh, alleviate any stresses during a, an actual crisis. Thank you uh, very much. There's going to be a post-test that will be part of the uh, uh, completion of this uh, in-service today. Any questions? Thanks. Have a great holiday.